Hello, we're here with Ian Thornton Trump, CISO for SIJAX, and we're going to talk MSS of the future and threat intelligence pertinent to today's disparate working environment. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, here in the UK, I'm CISO for a threat intelligence company, and I have an interest in a managed service provider back in Canada. So I'm seeing these a juxtaposition of two um, really kind of um, in, uh, industries that are designed around protection of the users, security, etc. So I think there's a lot to be said, and I think it's easier to start at a higher level uh, and then work our way down. Uh, we're seeing a fundamental shift in the way people um, have been working and are now working in that role full time. So what I mean by that is, um, as in the last five years, we've seen the emergence of work from home, uh, at least maybe one or two days a week. It's, it's been more advanced in the larger metropolitan centers like London, uh, simply because of the commute and the expenses related to that. Um, now we're seeing uh, businesses that um, are in sort of two categories. Uh, the, the first category being the new agile work from anywhere model. I know with uh, both of my businesses with remote support tools, we're able to support uh, customers uh, tens of thousands of miles away. Um, so that's sort of an interesting paradigm shift. But I think what we're seeing more than anything is um, a rise in the knowledge-based worker. And I think that traditional business models um, are in for a really rough ride. And in fact, I'll say things like, uh, we're not gonna recognize high street after this pandemic. We're not going to, I think this is probably the final death knell of print media as no one is really going out to the street corner to buy newspapers or from the corner stores. Um, so, so this is a, a, a trend that has been, um, I, I would say, slowly and incrementally increasing and now is um, basically 100% implemented where possible. Um, so this has uh, had some profound effects on the, des the design of live workspaces. Uh, this has a fundamental impact on the fact that IT uh, is now extended into the home networks like never before. Um, and we're seeing, I think, some struggles with um, IT organizations that didn't prepare for this transition. Um, I know some organizations have cut significant corners, such as they didn't have enough licenses to do uh, two-factor authentication on their VPN portals. So they have uh, decided to remove two-factor authentication from VPN. Others, <laughs> yes, others have, um, ha have decided that the risk of uh, their business not being able to function is worth the risk of opening up remote desktop directly to their infrastructure. Again, not protected by two-factor authentication nor VPN. So um, we're going to see uh, casualties on the field um, in cyberspace because of these kind of rash decisions. It's not like cyber criminals have taken a break right now. In fact, they've, they've really, I would say, um, resumed and, and, and got more aggressive because they know businesses are going to be making mistakes. Uh, businesses are now, in a sense, inherited a whole bunch of small little branch offices um, all over uh, the country, uh, if not the world. So a fundamental shift in work as well, too. I don't see our society ever going back to, um, at least in the knowledge working space, uh, a nine to five existence with two 15 minute breaks and a half hour for lunch. I think those days are over. Um, I think they've been over for a while, except for some very uh, uh, conservative and ardent uh, businesses. So I think, you know, when you roll all of that up into um, the current challenge that IT has, um, some companies are sitting back going, we were prepared for this. We made an investment in cloud services. We made an investment in software as a service. We made an investment in the appropriate hardware and the scale 
uh, of bandwidth. And other customers that neglected to sort of follow those trends and times are now scrambling. And I think also when you look at um, the idea of work from home, uh, you know, this has driven a phenomenal amount of laptop sales um, in, the, in the short term, uh, sort of like, oh my goodness, we need to not have anybody in the office anymore. The real question in my mind is, is that um, I think we're going to see virtual um, companies uh, take place, which kind of completely exist uh, online. Um, and, I, and I see the, the um, well, I see property values in commercial space plummeting. Uh, because I think we've proven that this model can work. Now, the real question is if we're in three months or six months of this social isolation, if it becomes uh, more enforced, uh, that will be sort of the true test of a company's resilience. So despite what you're hearing already of, you know, uh, companies um, making fundamental changes and trying to preserve their shareholder value and their bottom line, if their business model didn't embrace these new ideas of agility, um, they're going to be into a very rough ride, very rough ride indeed. So, you know, do you think that the MSS of today is in for a rough ride as well? Because, uh, you know, they have struggled to capture both the end user and channel market with the same message. And now maybe that's not such a dichotomy. Um, the, you know, distributors will have to do everything online anyway. Your managed service provider won't be able to suddenly send someone round as easily. What's the MSS going to look like after all of this? Yeah, so I, I honestly think that they're going to, uh, if they're, again, if they've embraced the idea of, you know, remote support, if they've embraced the idea of um, a technical stack that they have faith in to deliver, and they've convinced their customers to sort of make incremental improvements as part of an IT roadmap, it is going to be the best of times. It really is. This is an opportunity for growth and expansion in the MSS space. Um, more than anything I've seen, because the fundamentals are, is that you're now only as good as your internet connection, you're only as good as your home network. And I see a lot of uh, MSS um, going in that direction. I also see this being an opportunity for um, traditional IT services departments uh, to embrace MSS agility. So MSPs and MSS uh, providers have always been capable of, you know, doing the impossible for next to no money with tools, uh, RMM tools, uh, remote monitoring and management tools that corporate businesses have some, sometimes uh, been very reluctant to, very focused on services and servers mm. and not necessarily the workstations. But now as services and servers have now become SaaS offerings and cloud-based, um, the, the focus on desk side support and the focus on things that have always been sort of the bugbears uh, like printing uh, are now becoming uh, necessary and they're coming critical. And, and I think that was something that we weren't prepared for. And I, I know from the perspective of ISPs right now, um, they, I think, are struggling to put their money where their mouth is. Because what many of them have done is they said sort of, oh, um, in their marketing materials that we will uh, provide, you know, with 80 megs download and say 40 megs upload, right? Well, the problem is, is that's now being tested. And instead of downloading in vast quantities, I see a lot of traffic being pushed uh, from the homes up uh, to, to cloud-based services. Examples of, you know, graphics design, AutoCAD, all of those things. Working from home used to be somewhat inconvenient, but if working from home is now the only option, the bandwidth available for upstream is gonna become a huge, mm. um, a huge issue for large files and data sets that at-home workers might have to use and manipulate. So the good news is it's not everybody is doing data science on terabyte databases and not everyone is building AutoCAD drawings, um, you know, but 
a fair amount of people that are knowledge-based workers are being asked to do that from their house and they're finding just things, basic things like not having a dual monitor set up, a comfortable chair and a comfortable keyboard are really potentially impacting their, their productivity. Mm. Now, has, has, has this ended the net neutrality debate? Um, is, is, it, is it concluded that uh, internet is in fact a utility? Not only is it a utility, I think if anybody was attempting to make the argument that it wasn't a critical national infrastructure, I think that argument has now been settled. Yeah. I mean, quite clearly, um, the internet now is as important as water and power, of which I've had back-to-back -back outages recently, uh, thus plunging myself into somewhat of an apocalyptic moment uh, of waking up with no water nor no power. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough, I had internet <laughs> via my phone. So, I, you know, it, it, although, you know, we, we kind of joke a little bit about our cell phone providers and, and our ISPs, the reality is, is that um, these are now critical services for both business and, and for pleasure at home. If this had happened 10 years ago, um, we, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation in this manner, I believe. I 100% agree with you on that. I think that the tools, um, the collaboration um, uh, capabilities that we have now are, of course, completely dependent on the internet, but also just didn't exist. And, and this is where um, I think the, the, the profoundness of the societal change, uh, you know, the introduction of the motor car, the introduction of aircraft, um, we're now at another, uh, where our lives are now becoming, and at least from the workspace per, uh, perspective, completely virtual. And I, and I think that this is as, one, as defining a moment as being um, a Roman legionary in 409, just before the fall of Rome. And, I, and the, the repercussions of this are, are going to be felt uh, far and wide, including you know, the issues of, around the corporate bailouts uh, that are being considered. But the, the other piece of this is, is that I think from a government, a government perspective, um, we are not going to tolerate um, governments that make such impactful cuts to the public service or healthcare systems that they can't now protect us from these type of perils. Perils of which um, folks back in the 70s and 80s wrote academic papers about pandemics and preparedness based on the Spanish flu models from a long time ago. So, so for a government to sit there and claim that you know, this was a surprise, um, I think they weren't listening to the scientists and the medical professionals um, early enough. Um, and, and, I, and I hope that we now designate these type of things as sacrosanct in that not only should it be readily available to everyone, not unlike water, power, and heat, and, and internet, but the actual underlying government services that we pay our taxes to um, have to be delivered. And I think what we're seeing is a failure of policies and austerity um, and outright profiteering and corporate greed. Um, a new social contract for uh, MSS, MSPs, and the internet as well, I think. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, you know, being in information technology and on the threat intelligence side, what we're seeing in microcosms with business mirrors the max, uh, the, the mega, the galactic level. So I'll give you an example. We are now going to spend billions and trillions of pounds and dollars because of the impact of this virus, where we could have spent millions proactively getting ready for this type of pandemic okay so it's the equivalent of having to build having to pay for reconstruction and then build a dam rather than looking at the situation and going oh that area is going to get flooded i think we should spend the money now and the the only historical parallel that i can can i can readily access is uh, a project that happened in winnipeg manitoba in a notorious floodplain of the Red River Valley. In the 1960s, a premier of the province uh, called Duff Roblin, and this, um, this uh, scheme that he came up with is commonly referred to as 
Duff, uh, Duff's ditch. He built a floodgate um, system that essentially redirects the Red River uh, along a, a course uh, just before it hits the city limits of Winnipeg, a city of about three quarters of a million people, and bypasses the city um, and then exits the city at the north part of the, of the city back into the river system. So what that essentially does is takes that excess water, forces it through a channel around the city while maintaining the level of water. These are the type of projects that at the time are worth 50, 100 million uh, dollar projects. But a city of three quarters of a million people being under six feet, eight feet or 10 feet of water is far more expensive than 100 to 50 million. So if we take those life lessons and we boil them down to the MSSP world and the MSS world, what we're talking about now here is focusing on proactive activity prior to an impactful attack. And working in the threat intelligence side on the UK, we kind of know what the harboringers of a cyber attack are, what the impact of a cyber attack is in terms of the financial costs and the consequences that I think now we can start looking at these things that we can do to intercept these attacks and mitigate them uh, close to or before they really impact the business and organization. This is sort of that next level of going from detection reaction into a proactive model that ultimately saves a lot more money than having to go through reaction and, and, and uh, restoration. Perfect. Well, um, I think that's a positive note uh, yeah. to, to end on, you know. Um, we're going to continue our MSS uh, series of events at the end of the month um, with a look globally, uh, bringing in the MSS players globally uh, to, to address this very challenge. So um, uh, I hope to welcome you on to that. And uh, it's, uh, it's, been, it's been great catching up uh, and, and just getting a, a zeitgeist take on, 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 on what we are just now experiencing. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too.